All right. Welcome, folks. Um, welcome to the September 2024 uh, Fireside Chat, um, co-hosted by the Turing Way and Dragonfly Mental Health. Um, my name is Anne. I'm the research community manager for the Turing Way. Um, I'll be kicking off this session really, really briefly to tell you a little bit more about this call, um, about the Turing Way, and then I'll pass the mic to Alden and to Wendy, who will really be shepherding um, this session with a series of amazing speakers. Um, and so I'll get started with that, and then I'll come off mic. So few words about the Turing Way. Um, we're an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook on data science. Um, our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science possible and to make it both accessible and comprehensible for everyone. Um, and while I'm uh, kicking off the session today as community manager, I'm a part of a much wider team and community of folks, including so many of you, um, many of which are here, that represent this kind of wider and international community that um, creates and maintains the Turing Way. Um, all the folks here bring perspectives from their fields, their countries, their backgrounds, and their lived experiences that we're really excited to hear about and from. Um, we are hosted by, uh, but not exclusive to, the Ellen Turing Institute, um, which is the UK's National Centre for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Um, and our project is located in the Tools, Practices and Systems program, um, which we'll link in our notes document. And the TPS program helps to strategize and implement open infrastructure within the Institute um, and nationally across the UK. This Fireside Chat series, um, for the past number of years, I believe, since the end of 2021 has always been an effort towards creating space across open science communities and indeed the kind of wider open ecosystem um, in order to create a space where people can gather, exchange concerns, express challenges, share different practices that work within their respective contexts to build allyship with each other and to understand each other's work and perspectives just a little bit better. Um, and then with that being said, I'm really excited about this topic of mental health. It's been something that has really been discussed and come up so many times within the context of our community, within the institutions that we work with and all of our communities of practice and checking in with these folks, it's been incredible. Incredible. So really excited for the discussion. But a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, please note that we have the shared etherpad in the chat and I'll drop this link in here for folks who know the drill. Um, this document is to facilitate shared note taking and invite ideas from you. We really encourage you to use this document. Feel free to add questions you have there or in the chat um, and we'll make sure to bring those back, especially with our open discussion later on. We also have a code of conduct uh, that applies to this event, as is the case with all of our events, uh, to ensure accessibility and uh, respectful conduct and collaboration. If you have any concerns or would like to report an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable in any way, uh, please message me directly or send an email to um, our information, all of which is in uh, the shared document again. Um, and finally, uh, as a reminder, we will be holding this Zoom room open for an additional 30 minutes after the recorded one hour um, for an open discussion. It's completely optional to stay, um, but when we're able to turn off the recordings and ask questions directly, especially from y'all in the audience, um, it is perhaps a less formal environment and um, another way of getting to know our speakers and each other. And it usually ends up being a very interesting discussion. And so with that, I'm really delighted uh, to pass the mic over to Alden, my former colleague, um, who's now in very sunny California um, to kick off uh, today. On to you, Alden. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I won't tell you about the weather here um, because that's just mean. So, uh, well, you know, I know many of you. It's, it's great to see everyone joining. Um, but as an intro to me, I... Um, I'm a PhD biologist, but I have kind of had a bit of a meandering career and spent the better part of the last three years at the Alan Turing Institute, although I have um, left that position and moved back to California. And I just, I actually, um, we started talking about this event a while back while I was still at the Turing. And the idea was really to bring together, to the idea that I had was to bring together um, the Turing Way community with my friend Wendy, whom I've known since 2009. Uh, we went to grad school together and Wendy started this incredible organization called Dragonfly Mental Health. 
And not only that, but she knows um, really wonderful people doing similar work in mental health, you know, in academia and thinking about how we can really advance culture change, which is, you know, so parallel and aligned with what the Turing Way does and, and, and um, you know, specifically TPS at the Turing. So I thought this would be a great uh, group to bring together and I'm excited to have you all here. And so I'm going to be kind of the the moderator, Wendy's my co-host, but she's got a rough voice today, so we're going to let her not speak too much. But I will pass along um, to Wendy to introduce herself, and then we'll continue with the intros. Oh, no, sorry, Gabor was going to go first. Gabor is going to introduce himself. Well, I'll, I'll just add, uh, have a teensy tiny pre-intro intro, not of myself yet, but um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Alden and Anne and the Turing Way for um, hosting this. This is just amazing. Um, and it's such a fabulous opportunity for me to bring in people, bring together people that I really admire doing incredible work in Europe and in North America. And um, we, you know, need to be doing this all together because uh, every uh, academia is inherently global in my mind. And so this is where um, it's just really exciting to bring together an incredible group of people and introduce these concepts and ideas and initiatives that we've all been engaged in, um, which we'll tell you more about uh, over the last many years now, um, and then get fresh perspectives and ideas and concepts from, from the commu Turing Way community. Um, so that that's the goal. That's uh, what we're hoping to uh, start the conversation about here, and uh, maybe spark new collaborations and new new ways forward. So Gabor, would you like to go first and introduce yeah, yourself I can, I can. and why you're doing this work and what work are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> I can start. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, yeah, thanks a lot for initiating this and uh, organizing this event. I, I think you all agree that uh, these discussions are super important uh, to actually help not only our own mental well-being and mental mental health, but spread the word uh, across academic institutions and beyond about the importance of well-being in mental health. So my name is Gabor Gabor Kishminok. I'm uh, sitting at the moment in Hanover, uh, Germany. Here I'm leading a research group on artificial intelligence and education, but I, I think today I'm not going, not, I'm not here to talk about that. It's also quite interesting though. Uh, but I'm uh, here to talk about Remo. Uh, it's a it's, um, cost action initiated by the European Commission. I mean, the, the funding is given by the European Commission. The action was initiated by a handful of researchers on research on mental health. And uh, I'm chairing this uh, cost action. And um, how, how it started, actually, this is very interesting. Maybe if I have a bit of time to, to reflect on that. But back in 2017, uh, I was member, I'm still member of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And there was an um, association meeting in uh, Belgium, in Leuven. And a few of us started talking about our own experiences around academic working environments, or ref started reflecting on our careers. And, I, and we all realized that, hey, something is not right here. So we were all reporting on the same issues, thinking, thinking about burnouts, uh, horrible things happening at the workplace. I'm not going to get into details, but sometimes blood was even included, unfortunately. So it's a lot of horrible examples of um, ad hoc events um, uh, happened. And uh, we, were, we were reporting this from all over, uh, from all over Europe. And we thought, hmm, maybe there is a systematic problem here. Uh, in the European academic um, uh, world. So we decided to investigate this a bit further. And um, yeah, we, we decided to um, ask for some funding uh, for networking to do all the discussions, to do all the sort of groundwork. And cost uh, the association in Brussels has a program for, for exactly that. We applied for it, we failed, we reapplied again. And in 2019, we got the grant and started the REMO, the Research on Mental Health Observatory Cost Action. 
So what is Remo? Remo is basically um, a network of people who think that something has to be changed in our academic world. We started, just to show the numbers, we started this with like 10 people. And right now, Remo has more than 300, I think 320 researchers from 41 European countries. So basically, week by week, we are growing um, as, we, as we go ahead. So this is um, a network of activists, academics who, who want to make a change in academia. It's mostly about networking, so it's it's about getting together and discussing stuff. But parallel to that, we are also researchers, so we are also trying to do something what we actually equipped to do. So we are collecting data on uh, researcher mental health. I put it in the in the document, uh, the the link to to the survey what we conducted and uh, what was um, what's going to be published soon under open license. So we're trying to do research, we are publishing papers, we are organizing conferences, we're trying to uh, generate evidence about what's going on and use this evidence uh, to, to show to actually decision makers, institutional and, and, and uh, higher level policy makers that, hey, listen, this is the problem, this is the data, this is what was suggested. Um, so all in all, in very short, this is this is what we do, uh, and I guess uh, that there will be time in this next well uh, one hour, one and a half hours to go into the depth and uh, talk a bit about the details. Wonderful, perfect, perfect introduction. Thank you. Um, so I'll go next. So I'm. Uh, Wendy Ingram, um, as was mentioned, the uh, Alden and I have known each other since 2009. That's when we started our PhD program um, at University of California, Berkeley uh, together. And Berkeley was where my journey in this space of, of advocating for mental health uh, came because of, unfortunately, tragedy that our department experienced. So, um, uh, content warning for those who are here. Um, I will be mentioning, um, talking a little bit about suicide, uh, because that's one of the things that is a major driving force of my motivation, um, to, to talk about mental health in academic spaces. So in 2013, um, we lost a member of our department at every single level, a faculty, a postdoc, a friend of ours who was a, a PhD student and, a undergrad all in the same year, um, academic year, 2013 to 14, to suicide. And it was devastating. Um, and, and I and many other students got together and started talking about things and realizing that everyone was struggling, but everyone was hiding it. The stigma was incredibly, incredibly high. Um, and there, there was, there were too many things going on. And we, we, as students started a grassroots movement, um, to try to create change within our own community. Um, so that was kind of the origin for me in entering this space and thinking about these things from my, um, personal perspective and career perspective, I was planning on, uh, like my wonderful colleagues on the, on the panel here today, um, in the uh, fireside chat today, I wanted to be a research professor. I wanted to do, um, conduct bench science, uh, basic biology research into psychiatric conditions, but I wanted, I wanted to do basic science research. And, um, I, I ended up, um, continuing to engage in, in kind of grassroots movements at my postdoc, and then um, tragedy hit again. And uh, one of my very close friends from grad school uh, died by suicide as well. And so Chris Alvaro is who we named Dragonfly in honor of, um, because they had gotten a, Chris had gotten a, a tattoo of a little dragonfly when we were working on um, the By Students for Students organization at UC Berkeley, um, you know, now uh, over a decade ago. So um, 
that really changed my career trajectory. And it became very clear that not only was this a problem in the kind of smaller communities that I found myself in, um, as we started talking more and more, I ended up coming to a conference and speaking about the, the efforts I was doing in Berlin. And it, it became abundantly clear that it's not uh, um, you know, it's not an isolated incident. This is, these are things that are pervasive. And so in 2019, um, I and many amazing uh, uh, new brand new colleagues and collaborators um, that I encountered when I was in Berlin got together and founded um, a by academics for academics, independent nonprofit um, focused on cultivating excellent mental health among academics worldwide. So that's what Dragonfly, um, that's the, the kind of motivation uh, for, for us starting something. And the goal is to change the culture of academia around mental health and um, not, you know, kind of switch it from this uh, crisis response only or ignoring it kind of uh, general approach to um, to, to making mental health something that everybody is thinking about all the time in a really positive way, because it's so essential to our success and our well-being and what we try to do in science and in research. And so, um, we envision a world in which academics take care of our minds the way that, uh, athletes take care of their bodies. Um, it's what we need to what we need to do what we love and do what we do. Um, so uh, that's the vision and um, the organizational structure is that we decided to form a completely independent, no initial funding, um, nonprofit organization based in the U.S. but globally operating. And for the first four years, we've been a hundred percent volunteer based. And um, we recruited over 450 volunteers from more than 50 countries worldwide. Uh, we are non-discipline specific. Um, we work with anybody, anywhere, at, uh, uh, universities or academic associations. And we decided to take a very public health approach um, to what we're offering, what we provide to academic communities. And so we deliver uh, mental health literacy talks, we deliver skills trainings, supportive skills trainings, um, and then we, we uh, help with creating anti-stigma campaigns that, that um, allow for people within academia, within specific communities to talk about their own lived experience with mental health struggles in order to familiarize and destigmatize um, struggling with mental health and therefore improve the whole community's response to um, any struggles that do and will inevitably come up in, in within a community at least, not within each individual. But um, we also conduct research because like Gabor said, we can't help it, we do what we're good at. And so we do we do uh, conduct our own research. We have a uh, peer-reviewed publication on our anti-stigma video coming out in the next uh, few weeks to month. And um, we're also trying to work with bigger organizations as well to help them with their efforts to support people that they work with, like um, the European Space Agency, like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, they have their own internal efforts now kind of coming to light, but they don't really know what to do or what the best practices are. So we're trying to work with them to pilot and, and use the evidence that's being created by uh, amazing organizations like uh, Remo and then our other um, amazing speakers that are going to be uh, introducing themselves, their motivation and what they have done and are planning on doing moving forward. So um, uh, yeah, so we are a nonprofit, not affiliated with any organization and started with zero funding. So that's, that's who we are and, and where we're at. And I'll hand it off to Carrie, um, or Jennifer to, uh, introduce the national convening, um, next. Thanks so much, Wendy. Oh, I, um, Folks, I am delighted to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I think um, 
yeah, I feel humbled to be in community with each of you and having this very important conversation, especially, I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I feel like many of our workspaces have been, and I'm sorry, I think Danny, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about coming out of the pandemic and here we are, I had COVID four weeks ago. So I hope that you're well and your recovery goes well soon. Um, but the recognition is that so much of our lives got disrupted and work looked quite different um, as we were navigating the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. What I do, um, I'm Carrie wilkins Yell. I'm an associate professor um, of counseling psychology at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. Um, I'm going to come from this from a research standpoint and then transition into how we um, got to the National Convening on the Status of Mental Health in STEM. So as part of my work, as part of my research, um, as a counseling psychologist, I examine the ways in which work um, can be a conduit to either deteriorating um, or affecting the deterioration of our mental health or truly affirming our mental health. And I do this, and I look at this in the context of um, communities that have been historically minoritized, specifically within science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so I received a um, early career award from the National Science Foundation in 2020, um, 2020, 2021. And a part of that work was to look at mental health, the experiences of women who are racially, ethnically minoritized like myself. Um, so women of color at the graduate level, at the doctoral level um, in STEM graduate programs and how it is that these programs were impacting their mental health. As part of the research this past spring, um, and so let me back up for a sec, some of the impetus for this work, um, you know, Wendy shared out about um, the tragedies that took place at Berkeley and folks long before I knew Wendy and interacted with Wendy, I knew about the experience of what took place at Berkeley because of Wendy's work. And so your work, your scholarship, Wendy, had sowed the seed for me to feel motivated and called to bringing myself as a counseling psychologist and my research interests around STEM and being invested in bringing these two things together because of the atrocities that took place at Berkeley. So in spring of 2024, um, as part of this, you know, I got this grant, we were doing this research, and as part of the data collection, we were notified, um, again, trigger warning, that students had died by suicide, uh, minoritized students had died by suicide in a STEM department um, in the US. And I felt frustrated. Um, I got really, uh, just let me call it angry, because I knew that this isn't the first time we've been having this. We're losing students within STEM, and yet still, we, we know that this is a problem, but we weren't doing anything about it from the degree that the academicians in the US, in STEM, still aren't taking action despite losing so many students. And so I um, I never do anything by myself. I feel like when we do things in community with each other, we support our own wellness while we do this work. Um, and so I you know, reached out to my dearest friend and longest colleague, um, and longest collaborator, Jennifer Becky, who's on the call with me. And I said, you know, <sighs> We are publishing on mental health. We, we have the publications, we were doing the research, but it's not getting into the hands of the very people who need to be making the change, um, creating transformative change in our programs. Um, and so I said, if it doesn't exist, let's build it. Um, and so this was grassroots. We were like, we're not, it's not our institutions that we're saying we're sponsored. Nope, this is, we were, I saw the need, we're like, we need to do something. And so we thought, you know, let's build something together. Um, and, and I think hope folks, I hope that you're hearing across all of our, our talk is that these are things that were grassroots efforts that each of us saw a need, were moved and disturbed by what we were seeing in our communities. And likewise, um, that's what happened for Jennifer and I. And so we co-created the national um, convening. So the national status of uh, mental health in STEM and the intent behind it was to move the discourse, move it from these, you know, Wendy talked about folks who are experiencing significant amount of distress, but weren't verbally and visibly talking about it in these spaces. And that's largely because so often we're Mental health is taboo. We don't talk about it. Nobody says we're feeling um, depressed. We're feeling anxious. That's not something we talk about in higher ed, within academia, within STEM specifically. And so 
our thought was, let's elevate the discourse about mental health. Let mental health become a conversation that we just have. And we're not um, shamed for feeling a particular way. Shamed, especially when it's because we're existing in these systems that are taking a toll on our mental health. This is why we're experiencing the debilitating effects that we are. So trying to figure out how to elevate the conversation, but we didn't want it to stop at a conversation. We wanted to equip folks with the tools to be able to then take action in their respective spaces to start doing something differently. If we reach one, right, if we teach one, we reach one. And our thought process was let's bring folks to the table, let's have them be equipped with tools around how it is that we support someone who might be experiencing suicidal ideation, might be having um, a distressing experience because they're um, in an environment where racism is rampant, right? How do we have tools to navigate and support individuals? So through that, we brought together, um, you know, 40 speakers over five days for the national convening. And the intent behind it was to really have that be generative. Um, we had 300 individuals registered to engage in the conference. I want to turn it over to Jennifer because we both did this together. We really carried the load and co-collaborated collaboratively putting on this initiative. So she's going to share it a little bit more about what types of events we had, um, what we did. Really and truly, folks, this is we saw a need, we were motivated because I felt very disturbed by what I continued to see, especially in light of the fact that this is something that has been happening and trying to figure out how it is that we could do this differently. And so Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jennifer Becky. I am um, a faculty member in the Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University in the United States in Arizona. Um, and I also um, hold a role of Associate Dean of Inclusive Excellence there. But related to, I'm gonna go back to what Carrie said. I just wanna share a little bit about the my personal tie into this as well. So as Carrie mentioned, we've worked together um, for quite some time. And as Wendy, I also got a, a PhD in STEM. My PhD is in industrial engineering. So I'm trained in, modeling and analysis of semiconductor manufacturing, which I still think is really cool. And I'm still grateful I get to teach in that space and think about it sometimes. But um, during graduate school, um, I also experienced some mental health challenges, which for me were very overwhelming. And a, a serendipitous outlet for that is that this project that Carrie and I have co-led together with, I should, our shared mentor, Dr. Bianca Bernstein, for about 15 years now um, was called the CareerWise program. And that program was founded with some ideas around um, counseling psychology and how can we support women in PhD programs to have tools to support their well-being and their ability to continue in an environment that's not always healthy for women. So. The point for me was that having being an engineer and then having an opportunity to engage in research with a community that was very welcoming to talking about mental health was very different for me. And so I went from this STEM space to having an opportunity to have kind of an affirming and welcoming outlet and a place that really welcomed me. And I felt a little bit better. It didn't solve everything, but I felt a little bit better. So then anyway, that started a long set of research that um, that Carrie and I and our colleagues have been doing. And through that research, we've focused on trying to understand the impact of racism, sexism, ableism on primarily minoritized communities, as Carrie has been talking about. Um, and one of the things that emerged not only in the career early career award that she received, but previously in our data through this shared project of CareerWise is how these things are really taking a toll on the mental health of women. So we're seeing this from a research perspective. We're knowing that it's happening in real time. And as Carrie said, she's she is one of her things is let's build it. So I love working with Carrie and I was grateful that she invited me to, to co-create with her in that space. And so she mentioned the national convening 
on the status of mental health in STEM. Um, and she mentioned all the things about it being a grassroots effort. But she didn't say that we put this together in about six weeks. So it was a very um, fast paced <laughs> experience, but we were very proud of it. And some of the sessions, so she mentioned that we had the about 300 people enroll and we had, we ended up having 17 different sessions, panels, talks with over 40 speakers. And some of them, our, our primary entry point in alignment with our work and our values and our awareness of lived experiences is to sort of deconstruct the separation between equity and mental health and so, and well-being. And so we really were, were focused when we curated this, the, the set of speakers. And one of the speakers who was there was Wendy, by the way, I don't know, Carrie, if you mentioned that. So that was, a, we welcomed her and we're grateful for her contributions there, um, was just to highlight the impact of having to navigate systems of oppression rooted in ableism, racism, sexism, um, and how that takes a toll. And so we were able to bring together um, some identity focused communities there. We had a panel um, focused on and for black women, we had Latina and Latino faculty um, sharing about their experiences. Um, we had sessions talking about practical tips for things that we can do to support well-being and mental health. Um, we had some great examples of people that have really put these things into practice in an academic setting. Um, so the the link to the full program for that particular event is in the frame pad. So we can you can check that out. And I'll pause here because we have some other great questions. But uh, um, as Carrie said, I'm really grateful to be able to be here and in this community with you all. Um, I'm excited for the hear the rest of what everybody's going to share. Um, so, Anne, I'll let you take over spotlighting. I'm not sure who if we're supposed to put all the speakers now on the screen or how that works. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your intros. Those were really, really wonderful. Great to learn about all the different organizations and the work you're doing. Our first question, um, so Carrie and, and Jennifer, you made a great um, intro into this because we wanted to talk about inequalities and inequities in um, addressing mental health in academia and how these stressors are, you know, intersect with um, systems of oppression and inequity. And so maybe I'll turn it over to Wendy or Gabor to start um, so we can get kind of how, how their uh, organizations think about this and add that to the conversation. So I get, or you want to start, Wendy? Shall I start? Uh, so, you go ahead, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, so. When we started Remo, this was not really in our focus point. So I, my, my very quick answer would be that we are not uh, uh, targeting mental well-being from this angle. So what we are doing is two things. Try to, uh, no, three, try to empower researchers, regardless what kind of background uh, they have, uh, if they uh, have disabilities or they're coming from a minority group, doesn't matter. Try to empower them in their own context, working context. We try to, this is one, two, we try to push institutions to listen and to not only to listen, but also to engage in discussions. Because oftentimes what we have seen that the management of an institution, probably Jennifer, who is also part of the management, as I heard, sometimes the management of the institution simply doesn't have the same view on the very same organization than the researchers. And there are very limited amount of platforms to discuss this. So we just realized that often these kind of communication channels within institutions are missing. And then the big question is, Okay, if something is missing, how can we set this up? But again, this is something what you do locally, at your institution, in your own context. And the third thing what we do is try to influence policy, uh, institutional policy and higher level, uh, national or European level policy. And I have good news as well. So based on um, what, we, what we have done in the past five, six years, 
the community can really make a change. I give you a few examples. Um, last year, the European Commission, the European Council, uh, accepted and uh, put it into legislation the new charter uh, for researchers. That's basically a set of recommendations, almost rules, how institutions should organize research work and how they should treat researchers. And I think one of the great success of our advocacy in the past year, that well-being and mental health is explicitly mentioned in that document and made the, the institutions are made responsible for creating the boundary conditions for them. Now, and, and this is a document where you can take and use it as a stick to beat your institution with. Because it's going to be with us for the next 10 to 15 years. The, the previous charter uh, was done in 2007 or something like that, really long time ago. So does, these are not documents which change very often. And another thing, like the, now the European Commission is building us some sort of certification system to make sure that uh, institutions who adopt and institutions will adopt this document because it's in their interest to show that we, 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 we care. So the uh, commission now wants to uh, also certify these institutions. So I put these links in the, in the document so you can check that now there is a new certification system for human resource systems. What uh, universities and research performing organizations will pick up more and more often. And if they are certified for it, then they are accountable for it. So you should really pay attention to these small things, because if you have a problem, the, usually the framework, the legislative framework is there to protect you and to help you. Just people don't know about it. And people need to discuss more um, uh, about it. On an individual level, um, what, what we have seen, what is missing the most is the lack of openness to discuss. And this is really a sad story in my point of view, because if, if you go back and think about how do you do research, what are the most important uh, sort of ingredient of uh, research work? That's reflection. And that is that you always need to question your own work or your team's work. But in order to be that critical, you really need this sort of, I, I'm not, I do not really like the, the word safe place, but something like, something very similar, like an open, a very open environment where you can really open up and talk about anything and criticize anything in a constructive way, of course, not in a damage, damaging way. And what I have realized, what we realized during uh, the, the, the past years, that this kind of environment is missing very often. Very often, people are more focused on, it's like a factory, like, hey, if you want to have your PhD, you need to publish four papers on this uh, type of journals, uh, this A+, plus, A, A+, plus, B+, plus, whatever the institutional regulation. And this matters and nothing else. And, and, and this is how people will start organizing their work, organizing their teams. I, as a, a PI, I'm also in, like in, in this uh, double uh, uh, trap. I, I, I'm, on one hand, I'm pressurized by the organizations to meet uh, like the objectives that we have to publish, and otherwise no one will see us. Uh, but on the other hand, like there are all these uh, people in my team and you know the team can do much more than just the individuals. And how do you how do you um, sort of come up with those structures where not not the publication where you think that maybe not the publication is the most important output of the the whole uh, you know research process, but maybe the humans, maybe maybe the skill sets, maybe the the, the knowledge what we gain and what we sort of. Uh, as I say, internalize during the process. So 
Yeah, so and, and uh, for this, we, we try to organize like workshops, trainings. We have now an ambassador. We created an ambassador school just to do that, to think about what are your local needs, how to uh, sort of uh, create some sort of set of requirements, what you want to change, and then how do you start moving? How do you start uh, this change-making process? Again, all these documents, I put it in the in the uh, document, you can uh, get access, we publish everything uh, openly, uh, so you can use and reuse everything what you see. I think that I want to leave time for the others, I can talk uh, endlessly about it, but in a nutshell, this is this is how we work, this is how we see uh, this question, thank you. Thank you, Gabor. That was, yeah, I mean, we could all probably have a whole nother fireside chat just on this single question. Um, and then and then more and more. Um, we could have a national or international convening on it, I'm sure, with 40 speakers. Um, and maybe we should. So maybe that's one of the things that comes from this. Um, I'll, I'll be relatively brief um, just to introduce the concepts around what Dragonfly is doing, but we care extremely deeply about these things. And that's reflected in first and foremost, our values. So as a nonprofit organization, we have a mission, we have a vision, we have values, we have, and those are what drive every decision that we make as we pursue our mission. Um, and so two of our values are active inclusion and deliberate diversity. They needed to have those adjectives on them because um, inclusion by itself is not enough. Uh, diversity as an aspiration, not enough. We have to be very resolute about those things. So that was a very important first step for us and something that's embedded in everything we do and every decision we make and every program we create. Um, another element of, of addressing this specific issue of inequities um, is that we, within each and every one of our programs, um, at every opportunity, introduce and or touch on the elements of um, minority mental health and the stress, minority stress and explain and, and introduce concepts because not everybody's familiar with them. If, if it's not affecting you, one tends to ignore it and, and not have it in their, their space. So if we're talking to you about mentorship, you're going to hear about minority mental health stress and microaggressions. If you, if we're talking to you about burnout, we're going to talk to you about minority mental health stress and, uh, and the microaggressions. We're going to talk to you about um, ableism. We're going to talk to you about accessibility um, and and all of these things. We we include and and um, in all of our programs and all, all of our discussions in some way, shape, or form. Um, because if it's a systemic problem, which it is, we have to have systemic solutions embedded in every single conversation that we're having. Um, and then to because if you only talk about it separately, like if you talk about science and DEI, like you're you're creating this false premise, just like we do with mental health of, well, there's health, which is your body, and then there's mental health, which is different. And it's not. Like it's all one and the same. They're all interacting. Um, so we have to we have to unify these things. Um, and that's one of that's one of the ways that we do it is we include it in every single thing that we we create every conversation we have um, is just uh, you know embed it in the conversation because it is embedded regardless um, and we don't do it aggressively we do it very matter of factly we do it in the way that a lot of researchers appreciate which is state facts data response and then also. Um, layer on another really important thing that we do at Dragonfly is um, we we pride ourselves on being evidence based, um, and so we we collect all of the science, the research, the literature, the survey data, like the most up to date, um, best designed studies, and we include in that evidence base people's lived experiences. So lived experience of um, being minoritized, being uh, excluded, being uh, subjects of racism, uh, sexism, uh, experiences of ableism, 
Um, and so, and then one of the other elements that I've, I've been really proud to learn a lot more about um, in this work that we're doing uh, has been from the disability community. So for disability, one of their major uh, um, advocacies and sayings is nothing about us without us. And so they, we really believe strongly that we need to, if we're working on a new program on um, uh, neurodiversity in academia, it is equivalently important to look at and cite research and science, um, but also to include the voices and the experiences and the review of people with those lived experiences. And so we, we are now much more actively engaged in community-based participatory research um, than I've ever been in before. So it's it's really important. And it's it, I think that it's a, 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 a fabulous model to, to draw from that disability research um, community. And then finally, the um, just at our outset, we became a 501c3, a nonprofit with the express purpose of not making this finance required in order to um, receive our services and benefit from what we have. We are open access because of that as well. So we want every single community to have access to the resources and support. And we give away more than half of our programs for free for any organization or group that um, cannot afford to bring us in um, at our recommended donation. Um, the ones that can, we push <laughs> to do so because they can and they should and we should be valuing this with dollar bills um but we we are a 501c3 for um addressing the inequities around the world and between institutions and between career levels so i'll stop there great carrie or jennifer did you want to follow up on yeah great yeah Okay, Carrie, I was just going to say something quick, and then I, I know you want to, too. Uh, one thing that, that I wanted to highlight, um, maybe it's a nuance, but I think it's an important one, especially for people in the research community who are doing research in the space of mental health, maybe mental health in STEM. So one of the things that both Carrie and I value um, is that we hope to serve as not not the example, but an example of the necessity and value in working across a couple different lines, I guess we could say. So in, in the space of equity work, even equity work that people are doing um, in the community of STEM, it there tends to be work that's done by STEM people and work that's done by mental health people. And there's not as much work that's done collaboratively with people who have, you know, formal expertise in both of those things. So Carrie has a doctorate in um, counseling psychology and I have a doctorate in engineering and we have worked and learned together um, over many years. And additionally, I, I'm white and Carrie is a black woman and I'm a white woman. And we are doing a lot of work around sexism, gendered racism. And so having our cross-racial friendship, collaboration, that has provided um, what I would say is a helpful and not that common um, perspective to be able to position and talk about our work to different communities. Um, and so that's something different that I just wanted to highlight. And Carrie, I know you were going to say something, so I'll pause and hand it to you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you naming that, Jennifer. I, I, I teach, when I teach my social justice classes, one of the things that I'll tell my often predominantly white students and classes, I'll never be at your dinner table. I will never be able to reach the folks in your network. Um, and so Jennifer and I have these conversations quite often around when we talk about equity, there's a way that she's gonna reach folks um, in a, that I can't, I just can't. Um, and so it's necessary for us to have cross-racial partnerships when we're having, um, when we're dealing with equity and trying to navigate um, injustices and disrupting inequities. It's necessary to reach across racial lines to be able to do that. Otherwise we're preaching to the audience and we're not getting to the community Communities that need to hear what it is that we're navigating so that then change can happen. 
folks, I want to take us back to something that um, Jennifer said in, in the beginning when she was talking about her introduction. Equity work is wellness work. Like if I show up in a workplace environment and I'm navigating as an immigrant to the U.S., if I'm coming into these spaces and I'm hearing xenophobic remarks, like I am not going to be well. As a woman walking into a workplace, navigating sexist encounters, I am not going to be well, right? As a black woman walking into the workplace and navigating gendered racism, I am not going to be well. So the recognition that we're disaggregating equity and wellness work and mental health, no, those two things are coupled, intricately coupled. Because for me to be well with all of the ways that I show up in the world, and you know, I think in the US folks are pushing back on identity politics and all of the things, and it's unfortunate because there's an erasure of the necessity that the, our experiences are different because we exist in systems of oppression that is impacting us differently. So I need you to know my identity so that you know what's uniquely impacting me. And I think that conversation gets lost. And when it does, what we end up doing is we create interventions and we're so well-intentioned, but our interventions are monolithic. It's applying a one-size-fits-all approach Right. It's applying a one size fits all approach with the thought process that it's equality. So we are e equally giving folks access to mental health. In doing that, we need to remember that folks are impacted differently because of navigating systems of systems of oppression. So I need to know that um, you are thoughtful of when we're building out mental health, that you're centering the experiences of folks who are disabled. You're centering the experiences of folks who are racially minoritized. You're centering the experiences of, of women because there are different ways that these groups are being impacted. Now I'm gonna get the pushback that says, you know, Carrie, we can't center all groups, right? Uniquely, because it's impossible to do that work, get that. Resources are thin, things are, but if you can, as Wendy shared earlier, bring the people to the table who hold these identities so that then they can weigh in on the co-creating interventions that, so that they can be as inclusive as possible. But we can't disaggregate equity work and wellness work. Those two things go together. We have to strive to ensure that we are paying attention to the unique experiences and shifting away from this narrative of equality where everybody gets the same thing. Everybody doesn't need the same thing. Equity is I'm responsive to the unique needs of particular groups and I'm building hope creating, hopefully, an intervention with these unique needs in mind. That's what equity is, right? And so I think as we think about mental health and wellness more broadly, we have to center um, how it is that we're tailoring our interventions to the needs of folks. And in, the, in, in STEM, in higher ed, in academia in particular, too often what happens is culture. It's the culture of that academic space that is impacting particular individuals. And so if we're thinking about how culture change can happen, we have to foreground how is this culture uniquely impacting different groups so that then we can ensure that whatever intervention we build out is with those groups in mind and combating the system is, systems of oppression that are affecting those communities. That's how we do this work and it actually serves as many individuals as possible. Uh, thank you all for for that the response to that question. That was really wonderful. Um, I just want to let everybody know we are at what would generally be the end of the recorded time, but we're going to keep going and um, keep recording for a little longer so we can cover more of what we planned, but we'll still have some unrecorded discussion at the end. So our, we have two questions left. I don't think we're going to get through them if we want to have a little open discussion. So I will, maybe we can kind of link them together because we had two questions around one being around sustainability, kind of, you know, I think we've all talked a little bit about our funding and, and how, what model they use to keep their organizations going. Um, so maybe, you know, we, we move on a bit, but, but obviously sustainable, you can't divorce the last question from sustainability, which is kind of the, the forward thinking um, question about your grand vision. How do you see the work you're doing tying in with other work in academia, such as, you know, for instance, a Turing way, I, I just, Again, I love the the kind of the focus on culture change from different angles. And so so I think it's really one and the same, you know, how do you make this sustainable and what is the the grand vision and, and how do you see it as um, 
leading to a more you know equitable and healthy academic workplace and what does that look like um for you so i don't know who wants to to go first <laughs> i know it's a, you know just describe the ideal future i i think usually i go first right so go for it <laughs> um and i will address first the last question because i think we have to think backwards so we have to think about what is our aim and what what is like really the, the utopistic future, not the dystopic, the utopistic future, what we can imagine, and then um, gear up and uh, get all the equipment, interventions, whatever what we need to get there. So, and I really liked what Kerry was talking about. And I had one extra point there, what I would like to see in an ideal um future academic environment is uh, that this environment is respecting my identity, not only as an um, academic worker, but also as a person, because uh, these two are actually the same. So when it comes to many people talk about work-life balancing, but in, in academia, this is more or less the same thing. Like, uh, I think we discussed this before, that if you are at a conference, you're presenting your uh, work, it's uh, the, the person who is standing in front of the crowd and not the institution. And the person is you. You identify yourself with your work, with your life. Uh, and, and these are the same things. And suddenly you go to a university or a research performing organization to work, and then this organization wants you to separate these two worlds. Uh, this is, for me, it's a very odd um, uh, uh, thing to do. Uh, and therefore, my utopistic world, uh, view on an academic work, working in, and le working, learning, research environment is that I can be Gabor whenever I want. If I want to, to do my work between midnight and one o'clock in the morning, because that's my most creative time, what is super necessary uh, for uh, my work, creativity, new ideas, uh, reflection, then institutions should let me to do this, right? So it's also, it's also like, uh, and, and if you think about it, like the whole structure of the academic institutions, at least in my bubble in Europe, are very hierarchical, very, how to say, um, efficiency driven. So you have to, you always have to do your work very efficiently in a given time frame to meet a certain KPIs. So this is also, and because if you don't do that, then your contract won't be extended or there are financial consequences whatsoever. So it all goes back, like how we think about academic careers from an organizational point of view, like how do we fund research? How do we uh, create careers in research or in research, uh, research related idea uh, uh, worlds? And we have to start rethinking and uh, flexibilizing uh, this world a bit. So we really consider the identity of the people who add value to the research environment. Um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, I think that that would be my. And it's just one aspect of it. There are a number of different aspects of it. I don't really want to, I mean, don't, we don't have time to talk about it, but I think if there is something what is important is really uh, identity, taking care of the identity of people and doing something with this efficiency crisis. Hear your Jennifer, I'd, I'd love to hear your uh, responses next. So, Gabor, you know, I, I so appreciate what you just said a while ago, and, and the part that resonates and is sitting with me is this idea of how, you know, 
when we're at work, we're not well because of the practices and policies that are putting that are in place by institutions, right? So if efficiency and this idea of rigidity is what's being um, axed upon us, then we're having to conform to this and the precarity of our work is in some sense at risk because of these practices, we have to adhere to this. So I think about this as um, you're talking efficiency crisis, I say grind culture, um, right? But it's one in the same when we're thinking about it around there are practices and policies that are being mm, put on us and we're having to conform to these. And th th this, again, one size fits all approach really then is suffocating and it's de really depleting us and taking a toll on our wellness. The, 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 the aspect of this that I come back to when I think about this is how do we have institutions see us as and see our humanity, right? So at UMass Boston, we're talking about in what ways are we amplifying the need for rest? In what ways are we amplifying the need for how it is that um, individuals can mm, get their needs met and be institutions can be receptive to those needs? Because if, if I can't speak up and tell you that I'm navigating these challenges, you haven't created a culture where my voice can be heard. And so one, you need to be receptive to it. There need to be spaces for me to be able to share out. And then action needs to be taken. This action can't only be happening at the grassroots. All of us here on our call are doing grassroots efforts, but I feel like we're gonna constantly be working upstream if we don't start having institutional structures engaged in transformative change. Gabor, I love that, you know, you said earlier that you had good news because you now have the ability to policy change that you implemented or your, you know, your you and your collaborators implemented are actually holding institutions accountable. If they get this certification, there's an accountability mechanism that they now have to be responsive to. There's no such accountability here, right? So institutions can do whatever it is as it relates to mental health. And oftentimes it's making it invisible, right? We don't think about it. We don't talk about it while workers suffer, right? We suffer in silence. There's no space to talk about what's happening to our bodies, our minds, and our work suffers. So you're wanting grind, you're wanting efficiency. But if I'm not well, my work isn't well, right? And so part of me, a vision for the future, two things. I need to link arms with institutional structures, folks who have positions to be able to make change because this has to come from, um, it has to be ingrained into the fabric of the institution. It can't be a one-off, two people over here are doing this, three people over here are doing this. It has to be ingrained into the fabric. So institutions have to take action. And two, and I say this from a therapist standpoint, when I used to do therapy, I want to not have to do this work. I would like to be in a world where my mental health is supported. I'd like to be in a workplace where I show up and I don't have to worry that whatever demands, whatever practices, policies are taking a toll on me. So can I be in a workplace where I'm well? So that the work that we're doing that none of us are getting paid to do this. This is all extra labor on us, at least in my case it is. And so can I do the very work that I got my PhD to do, right? Is that possible so that then I'm not feeling inclined and the need to have to do this? So I want a world where we don't have to do this. That's my, that's, that's my vision. Jennifer, do you have any other uh, thoughts to add on? Um, well, I wrote down that my vision was where we don't need to do this work. So it's the same, the same from that perspective. And I, I just, I can't not highlight again, uh, last time, maybe, not last time, but one more time, that all the things we're saying about mental health are exacerbated when we're holding minoritized identities. So the grind culture, um, if you are also a Black woman, you are now whole, dealing with people's expectations and opinions about you that they just hold because of your identity and because of systems of oppression, historic, all, all of it. And so I just, I want to elevate that the grind culture or the efficiency crisis, I like both of those terms too, um, is exacerbated when we intersect 
with equity. I just, I don't want that to get lost in what we're saying. It's not getting lost, but I want to just say it again. Um, so yes, yeah, I'll pause because we're, time is short. But yes, my, I literally wrote down the, the future is, the vision is to not, not need equity work, not need work to elevate the importance of mental health. And Wendy, I also will say, I like your framing around taking care of our mind, like we, like athletes take care of our body. I think that resonates and I like that messaging a lot, so. May I come up with a short? It's preventative. It's thinking about it in a way of like, we need to have it operating at the highest level to perform at the highest levels. It doesn't reduce our aspirations of what we want to do in the world, which is, you know, create new knowledge and experience and um, and solve problems in in a beneficial way for all beings. Um, the the it's it's just the right thing to do as opposed to a selfish or soft thing that reduces the outcomes. It's not at all. Um, sorry, Gabor, you were just gonna say. Yeah, just a quick reaction. So the funny thing is that it's not only about researchers. It's really the academic community and. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, yesterday I was in Brussels and um, I had a meeting with um, research founders. And these research founders were complaining about their well-being because they are overworked, because they receive too many funding applications. They receiving too many requests uh, for money and they cannot sort of cope with it and people are burning out, that means the workload will be even, you know? <laughs> that basically means that uh, we are sitting in the same boat. Uh, they are also suffering on the other side of, uh, of, of the building from a very similar um, sort of, uh, from the very similar pandemic, the, the efficiency pandemic. Uh, and um, we have to do something. We really have to change uh, a lot in terms of structures, how we organize our work, how we found and uh, finance um, uh, universities and uh, research work, at least here in Europe. So maybe I'll offer just a few words and kind of reflections to bring a few of these threads together, and then um, I'll then you know decide where where we go if we transition to the dis open discussion or not, or you have another question, but. Um, the efficiency crisis, the grind culture, what we hear in our surveys at Dragonfly all the time is the toxic culture of overwork. Um, it's all the same, right? And one of the things that's actually related to a reflection that I've been having about Dragonfly and as a nonprofit volunteer-driven organization, what are we running into? Like, what are, what are the real boundaries of our capabilities. And I think it's the same as what a lot of people are experiencing and naming in academic spaces, very related to those, you know, three different words for the same thing, which is an element of imposter fears or imposter phenomenon. And one of, so at Dragonfly, like when we first started, there were like all of us, all these academics from all different disciplines came together and none of us knew exactly what we were going to do, but we all were like, well, no one else is doing this. So like, let's just hop in together and figure it out. And we created some structures. We had some working groups, like a few people raised their hand and said, okay, I'll lead this group. I don't know the first thing about systemic change, but I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, I don't know. Like, sure, I'll run some meetings um, and, and kind of lead a group of people. And then um, same was true for all these other things, these, these groups that we put together. And because everyone was a novice, we all had this like, okay, I mean, no one else is doing it, so I guess I'll do it. And now that we're four, almost five years old, I'm running into problems where people are like, well, I'm new to the organization. I don't want to take a leadership role. And I'm like, you're a freaking PhD in whatever the heck you're a PhD in. Like you're a leader already. Like it doesn't matter. No one else knows how to do this. You are the best suited person on the planet to take over and just lead this working group for a week, for a month, for six years. Like it doesn't matter. Like but with volunteer efforts, and with like carving out this new territory, um, it's like everyone 
everyone is the right person to be doing it. Like get in there and do it together as a group and don't be afraid of that. And um, I think that it's a, a result, both in the academic space, the like relevance of people expressing fears and uh, of being an imposter or being found out or not being good enough or enough of an expert. Um, and then also in the volunteer space that we're in right now is that people are like, we have this over this culture of focusing on the product um, and not the person. And the people and the are are the thing that are allow for the product. <laughs> like they're inextricable. Like and and we're we're focusing on the wrong things. Um, so it's it's not about like we I don't know. So those those are just kind of like networks nodes of this met this this um, web we've been weaving in the conversation today. I wanted to maybe pull up and point out and. Um, you know, we need, we need to focus on the, the, per the people, the person, um, there and clearly, clearly, clearly all of our work has really emphasized and been successful on the network, the network, the community building and the collaboration. Um, so I'll pause there and hand it back to Alden and thank Alden and Anne so much for hosting us. Um, tell us where you want to go next. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, everyone. That, that Those are really wonderful answers. I think we should move to um, some open discussion in the time we have left. I know that I think um, maybe it's Carrie has to jump off. Um, I'm not sure if everyone else can stay a little longer or if our <laughs> can stay a little longer. But yeah, I'll stop talking and uh, let's turn the recording off and then open to any questions in the chat or please unmute yourselves. Um, let's see, Anne, can, can I stop the recording? Right. Or yeah, let's we'll stop the recording now. Thanks so much. And I will also unpick.